Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Eaglebrook Church. Really good to have you with us today. If you're at one of our uh, campuses around the Twin Cities and you made it to the physical location, way to go. We are always light at the 9 o'clock service on Daylight Savings anyway, right? Like we always, everybody comes at 11 and then you add a snowstorm to it. I love you people. Thank you for being here. I know there's thousands more of you who are watching online. I still love you too, but I really love those of you uh, who are at one of our locations today. And I've got some good news for you, okay? This isn't for those of you who are in Florida or California right now. Just go outside for a second, close your eyes, look at the sun, do what you gotta do. But this is for those of you who are here in the Twin Cities. I got good news for you. In one week, this next week, is the Twin Cities Auto Show. I love the Auto Show. Look forward to going every year. In two weeks, March Madness, college basketball, the Final Four is in the Twin Cities. I am giddy about this. In four weeks, outdoor baseball, Home opener for the Minnesota Twins. If you're in Chicago, the Cubs or the White Sox. Trust me, you're going to be sitting outside in shorts. Just four weeks. Book it. Four weeks, you're going to be sitting out there soaking in the sun. It's going to be glorious. In six weeks, we are launching our eighth campus out at Lakeville South High School. And we could not be more excited about what God is going to do out there. There's actually a team out at Lakeville South this morning getting prepared. We launch in six weeks, which is the weekend before Easter. And if you have family members or friends who live out in the south suburbs, would love to have you invite them to church. If they're not currently attending a church that teaches the word of God, would love you to have invite them. Because we have been feeling for a long time led to try to reach more people in the south suburbs and just say, hey, just come and see. Just just come and see if this could be a place for you. Speaking of which, today we are in the third week of a series called Come and See, and it's based on the first chapter, or it's based on the book of John, rather, in the Bible. And in the first chapter of John, Philip, one of Jesus' closest followers, he wants to go find his friend Nathaniel. Philip believes that Jesus is the Son of God, and he wants to introduce Nathanael to him. But Nathanael is understandably skeptical about this. He's not so sure that Jesus is the Son of God. And I love how Philip ends up inviting him. He says this, he says, just come and see for yourself. And that's been our invitation to you in this series. Just come and see for yourself who Jesus Christ really is. Not what you saw on CNN or Fox News, not what show you saw on the History Channel or the Discovery Channel. Don't just believe something because that's how you were raised or that's what the majority of Americans believe, but come and see for yourself who the earliest eyewitnesses said that Jesus Christ was. Jesus is the most influential person who's ever walked on planet Earth. That's hardly even a controversial statement. We owe it to ourselves to take time to come and see who he is for ourselves, to come and see if he could make a difference in your life. Today's message is titled, It's Gonna Cost You, because while salvation is a free gift from God, there is a cost to following Jesus Christ that we need to consider. And if you're newer to your faith or you're newer to church, you might be going, cost? No one never told me about a cost. Several years ago, my wife and I were lying in bed. It was about 10.30 at night. We were just reading next to one another. When she turned to me and she said, it's time. Now, if she had been pregnant, I would have leaped into action, which was surprising that she wasn't. We have five kids. This is like the only time in 13 years that she wasn't pregnant, right? But if she had been pregnant, I would have leaped into action, but she wasn't. And so just connect the dots with me here. It's 10.30 at night, just hanging out in bed. I said, time for what? (laughs) She said, time to buy a Blendtec juicer. I said, what? Why now? She said, well, several years ago, I told one of my best friends how much I wanted a Blendtec. And she said, right there, the very next day, I went onto Facebook and saw that she had gone out and bought one, just like that. My wife said, I decided to wait until our current blender conked out, and that day has come. She said, it took me a half hour to make smoothies today. And then she starts giving me the sales pitch on this thing. She says, you can make anything digestible. I thought, why would I want to make something digestible 
that's not supposed to be digestible. I mean, what are we blending up here? Chicken bones and tree bark or something? Then she had me read the reviews on Costco.com. And I am not making this up. The first review said, not a day goes by that I don't regret buying my Blendtec sooner. Really? Every single day you wake up just a little down, a little depressed, you can't figure out why, and then you go, oh, that's it. I went the first 30 years of my life without a Blendtec. Another person in their review said, if it's possible to be in love with a juicer, I am. Another person said, I've been waiting to buy one of these since I was 10 years old. They had an exciting childhood. (laughs) And then another person titled their review, Dream Fulfilled. May I be the voice of reason here? As Steve Martin so aptly put it in his movie, Father of the Bride, it's a blender. It blends things. Now, I realize that in saying this, my inbox is going to be filled up on Monday morning with those of you telling me how much you love your blend tech and you love your Vitamix and you couldn't live without it. And I'm really looking forward to that. But here's what was odd. In all of my wife's sales pitching, she left out one important detail. The cost. Now, that's odd because my wife is about as frugal as they come. Every summer, we get into this back and forth because I want the thermostat set at 68 degrees, and she bumps it up to 72 just to save money. So for her not to mention the cost, that got my radar up a little bit. Then as I started reading these reviews, I noticed how many of them talked about the apprehension that they had in buying one because of the price. Do you want to know what a Blendtec blender costs? $400 to blend things. I said to my wife, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I said, I am putting my foot down. We are not spending $400 on a blender. And with that, I'd like to show you our Blendtec juicer. (laughs) I mean, I am telling you, this thing can blend anything. It's unbelievable, really. Now, my wife did want you to know that she got this at Costco for less than $400. And I wanted you to know that I will have the thermostat set at 68 degrees every day this summer. (laughs) But here's what my wife did. She told me all the good stuff. She told me how it can blend anything. She said it's easy to clean, convenient to store. She told me all of the good things. But she left out one important detail the cost. This happens in Christianity as well. That in our efforts to get people to buy into Jesus Christ, and I realize that's kind of a crass term, but in our efforts to get people to trust Christ and to believe in him, we tell them all the good stuff. We say, you can have eternal life. You're going to live forever. We say, God has a wonderful plan for you. God is always going to be with you. He will guide you, heal you, save you. And then we attach a Bible verse to it, like John 10.10, where Jesus says, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. Another translation says abundant life. Or Jeremiah 29.11, where God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And now we've got them eaten out of our hand. Now they're like, oh, abundant life. Plans to prosper. Wonderful plan. I mean, sign me up. I'm I'm in. I'm going to follow Jesus. That sounds incredible. Now, of course, all this is true. Through Christ, you can have eternal life. I believe that God does have a wonderful plan for you. May not be your idea of wonderful plan, but when you get to the end of your life and you're afforded the opportunity to look back, you will go, God, that was the best plan for my life. God is always going to be with you. He can guide you, heal you, and save you. All those things are true. They're just not the full story. There is a cost to following Jesus Christ. 
there are times when it will cost you friends. There are people who will go, you know what, I don't, I don't want to hang out with them anymore. Let's, let's not call them. They're all Jesus-y now. They're, they're like this Jesus freak, and they're not, they're not fun anymore. They don't like to do the same things that we used to do, and you'll start to lose friends. You may even look at your friends and go, you know what, I don't think I can be friends with that person anymore because they so pull me away from my relationship with God. I need to find some friends who are going to build me up in my faith. And it will cost you friends. There are times when it might cost you your reputation. You'll have a college professor mocking you in front of all the other students because you happen to believe that there's a God who created this world. And your reputation or your social standing might begin to suffer or be costed a little bit. It might cost you a moment of pleasure. And you might think, you know what, I really want to look at that. I really want to go to that. I really want to drink that. I really want to do that. I really want to participate in that. But you know that God doesn't want you to. And your faith might cost you that brief moment of pleasure. It might cost you an opportunity. There might be a job or an opportunity and people look at you and go, you know, they're just all about character and character development. We need someone who's in here about the bottom line. And they pick or choose someone else. There are times when your faith in Jesus Christ, it might cost you. And I wanted you to hear that today so that you didn't get into a relationship with God. And all of a sudden something bad happens in your life. And you're going, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for this. This isn't the abundant life. This isn't the wonderful plan. This isn't the plans to prosper me. God, I, I didn't sign up for this. Happens all the time. Part of the reason why it happens is because there's a difference between being a fan and being a follower. Let me explain what I mean by that. There are people who are a fan of a musical group, right? They buy the t-shirt, they go to the concert, they might purchase the album, but five years later, that group's not popular anymore, and they move on to a different band. They get rid of the t-shirt, they can't find the album, and they laugh at the fact that they even went to that concert. And then there are some people who are followers, like the Grateful Dead has followers. They're playing a show out at Red Rocks in Colorado. The Deadheads, as they're called, are there. If they're at Madison Square Garden, they're there. Some of you are like, who are the Grateful Dead? It's like right over, it's an age thing, right? Just pick any music group you want. Justin Bieber, Bieber Fever, I don't know who you're gonna, NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, pick it, whoever you want. But there are some people who follow a band around. Same thing happens with sports teams. Some people are like, you know what, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon. That team's really good. And then there's followers who, no matter if they're making the playoffs or not, they could be in last place. They are dedicated to that team. Here's the problem. Some people start following Jesus Christ, get this, as a fan and not a follower. They just think, you know what, some of my friends are doing this, and, you know, I might as well go to this church thing or this Bible study thing. And they just kind of start to follow as a fan. And as long as things are going well in their life, they're, they're, they're committed to that. But when something bad happens, now they're like, oh, I'm out. And then there's followers who are like, Jesus, I am committed to you. 100%, no matter what, I want to put you first in my life. And no matter what happens, God, I will follow you. I was talking to a woman years ago who told me that she only reads the book of Psalms in the Bible. She said, I only read Psalms because they're encouraging and they make me feel better about myself. I said, well, what about the rest of the Bible, the rest of the things that Jesus says? She said, no, I don't read those because they talk about sin and obedience and those kinds of things, and that just doesn't make me feel good about myself. I thought, that's a fan. That's not a follower. That's a person who's going to the Bible and instead of surrendering to it and submitting to it, they're saying, you know what, if I agree with this, if I like this, if this is, makes sense to me, well, then I'll do it. But if I don't like it, and I don't agree with it, well, then let's just cross that out. Let's just say, you know what, I, the Bible was written so long ago. We're in a totally different world today. I don't think that verse applies to us. Thomas Jefferson, our third president, did this. He actually took a scissors to his Bible and began to cut out verses that he didn't like or agree with. 
And you can buy this Bible today. It's called the Jefferson Bible. I don't know why you would, because it's just Jefferson's human opinions on what he agrees with and what he likes. It's a fan, not a follower. Now, this whole phenomenon of being a fan or a follower, it's not, it didn't start with Thomas Jefferson. It, it doesn't start with us today in America. In fact, in John chapter 6, Jesus encounters a group of people who look like followers, but they're really fans. We're going to pick things up in verse 26, but before I do, let me just give you a little bit of context here. Jesus has just gotten done feeding 5,000 people using a few loaves of bread and a few fish. Fed 5,000 people, and then Jesus slips away. And so in the middle of the night, this crowd of people is hungry again. And they start looking for the old country Jesus buffet. And they can't find him anywhere. And so they decide, you know what, let's, let's go find this guy. So they get in a boat, and they cross a lake in the middle of the night, which was rather dangerous back then. And when they finally find Jesus, here's what he says to them. Jesus says, the truth is, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you saw the miraculous sign. See, Jesus just cuts right to the chase. He just gets right to the heart of it. He says, you're not here because you love me and trust me and believe in me. You're just here because you wanted some free food. You're not a follower. You're just here because you want God to do things for you. Free food has a way of bringing the fan out in all of us. My oldest son has a lot of personality, and there's a few things in life he just loves. And he loves food, loves to eat, and he loves a good deal. So one day he was sitting in our house and he was going through coupons, which I don't know any 13-year-old who else who does this. But he's sitting there, you know, going, going through the coupons that come in the mail, and he sees that there's a quick trip that's opening in Blaine. And as a part of their grand opening, they have five straight days of deals. Free food, deals on food, that kind of thing. Now, this was during the polar vortex. So for three straight days, all I heard was, can we go to quick trip? How about, let's just go to quick trip. And I'm like, I am not going to go warm up my car for a half hour and risk my life so that we can go to quick trip. I was imagining our kids getting back to school and their teachers going, what did you do over these three days? Some kids are like, oh, we had hot chocolate and played board games. My kids are like, we went to quick trip. But after three days of just being cooped up in the house and making messes and irritating one another, finally I said, you know what? We're going to Quick Trip. And I probably shouldn't share this with you, but we went to Quick Trip Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. <laughs> they had different deals every day. But one day you could get six donuts for $1. I got 18 donuts for $3. <laughs> I felt like I had to. I thought God would be disappointed with me if I didn't take advantage of this deal. But I have five kids. So one day we went to Quick Trip, we got 18 donuts, two chicken sandwiches, a gallon of milk, and five hot chocolates for $4. And don't judge me because I met a lot of Eagle Brook people when I was there. It was like all Eagle Brook people and then older people who love coupons. That was like the demographic at Quick Trip. But here's the thing about Quick Trip. As long as they had free food, I was there. But the minute that those deals stopped, I quit going. It's because I have a Shell gas station credit card. And so as long as Quick Trip has free food or deals on food, man, I'm, I'm first one in line. But when those deals were over, I went back to Shell because I'm a fan of Quick Trip. I'm a follower at Shell. And that's what Jesus says to this audience. He says, you know what? You guys are just here because you want free food. You just feed me, feed me, feed me. It's all about you and what God can do for you. And you're never once thinking about the sacrifice or how you could contribute to the work of God. And so this crowd of people responds back to Jesus. They replied, well, what does God want us to do then? Fine, you caught us. 
Guess God wants us to do something. God wants us to contribute something or sacrifice something. What is it? And Jesus responds back to them. This is what God wants you to do. And I hope you're leaning in at this point because this isn't just for them. This is for us today as well. He says, this is what God wants you to do. Believe in the one that he has sent. That's Jesus. Believe in him, trust him, surrender to him, follow him. They replied, well, you must show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. If Jesus had text messaging, this is where you give the face palm emoji. It's like, because remember what Jesus had just done. He had just fed 5,000 people using a few loaves of bread and fish. That's a miraculous sign. But do you know anybody like this? Someone who says, you know what, I'll believe in God if he does a miracle for me. I mean, if he writes a message in the sky, dear Joe, I'm real, sincerely God, then maybe I'll believe. Or someone who says, you know what, God, I, I, I will believe in you if I get this job. If you'll just answer this one prayer, God. God, if you'll just give me this second chance. God, if you'll just do this one thing for me, God, I promise you, I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to pray every day. I'm going to go to church every day. I'm going to become a orphan, orphan, open an orphanage in you know, Nicaragua. I mean, I'll do whatever you want, God. But here's what you need to do for me first. People oftentimes wonder, why does God make such a big deal out of faith? Why, is, why does the Bible say that you have to have faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved? Well, why does God care about faith? This is why. Because faith requires a person's heart. Anybody can come to God just because they want stuff. But faith requires surrender. Faith requires a person's heart. And get this, God wants people who love him. Not just people who want something from him. Big difference. You see, faith doesn't believe because it sees the miracle. Faith believes first and then sees the miracle after that. You know, people might ask you at times, why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in Jesus Christ? And my answer is, for one, I believe that there's a creator of this world. If you study the scientific evidence, you will find that this universe has not always existed and that there must have been a creator because something doesn't come out of nothing. And then I will tell people that the historical evidence for the resurrection will blow your mind. I mean, you would think there's no evidence whatsoever that a person who was dead came back to life. The evidence is so strong. But then I will oftentimes say to people, one of the reasons why I believe in God is because I have experienced him at work in my life. To which some of them will say, well, I haven't. So if God wants me to believe in him, then he needs to do some sort of miracle. But that's not how it works. In fact, a little bit later, this crowd of people turns to Jesus and they said, hey, remember our ancestors? Remember the Israelites when they were wandering in the wilderness? And what did God do? God provided bread, manna out of heaven. Jesus, just do a miracle like that and then we'll believe. But here's what's ironic about that example. If you remember, when the bread first started coming out of heaven, the Israelites were like, whoa. And they worshiped God and they followed God and they were in awe of him. But then after a while, they started to grumble. And they started to complain and they're like, you know what, we're sick of the bread, we want some meat. And then a little bit after that, many of them started to follow false gods. Why? Because they were fans. And they thought, you know what? God's not doing what I expected him to do. God's not doing what I wanted him to do. So I'm just going to leave. I'm going to go find a different God who will do those things for me. So Jesus says to them, if you want a miracle, it's me. In three days, I'm going to rise back from the dead. And Jesus, here's what he says to that group of people. He says, I assure you, anyone who believes in me already has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. And then he goes on, he says, your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. That's true. But they all died. You're conveniently forgetting that. However, the bread from heaven gives eternal life to anyone who eats it. 
I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, Jesus said, offered so the world may live. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. They still just wanted food. Crowds are fickle. I mean, remember, Jesus isn't chasing after this group of people. He's not going, hey, believe in me. Here's some more bread. They followed him across a lake in the middle of the night. And now at the height of Jesus' popularity, he launches into this speech about how he's the bread of life and you have to eat his flesh. Verse 60. Even his disciples said, This is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Even Jesus' closest followers are like, I'm out. I I don't even know what you're talking about right now. And they might have been pulling Jesus to the side and going, Jesus, what what are you doing? Just just stay on brand, Jesus. Okay, just just stay on brand. We, we, We got some momentum right now. There's a pretty good crowd of people here. And just, you know, we're about to sign a record deal, book deal, movie deal. I mean, we're moving in the right direction. Just don't don't blow this for us, Jesus. Just do a miracle. Heal somebody, feed somebody. Better yet, do that water into wine thing that you did. People love it when you do that. And yet Jesus doesn't do it. Why? Doesn't he want a bigger crowd following him? Doesn't he want more people around him? The only explanation is that Jesus wasn't interested in fans. He wanted followers. He wanted people who would turn to him on a daily basis as the bread of life and would turn to him for their sustenance and their strength in every situation. Jesus didn't want just more Twitter followers. He wanted more fully devoted followers. And so the question I have for you today is, is that you? Are you a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ? Or are there times when you waver and you're kind of committed but kind of not? You're kind of in but you're kind of not. And I'll tell you, there are times when we all fall into fandom, myself included, but I want to give you two specific situations that oftentimes are a temptation to become a fan and not a follower. And the first one is this. Are you willing to follow Christ even when you feel embarrassed by your faith? So Jesus turns to his disciples at this point, and he says, does this offend you? Another translation said, does this embarrass you or shame you? Then what will you think if you see me, the Son of Man, return to heaven again? In other words, you haven't seen anything yet. I mean, you just wait till you see me rising up off the earth, back up into the sky, into heaven. Try to explain that one to your work buddies. See if you're not embarrassed a little bit. At another point, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, if a person is ashamed of me and my message, these are really sobering words, I, the son of man, will be ashamed of that person when I return in my glory. My son Hudson is 11 years old, but four years ago, when he was seven years old, he got invited to do the delivery of the game at a Timberwolves game. And the delivery of the game is where a little kid brings the basketball out to the referee and they show it on the jumbotron. Here's a picture of Hudson giving the ball to the referee. And the Timberwolves were playing the Golden State Warriors that night. And Hudson's favorite basketball player is Steph Curry, who's the point guard of the Warriors. Loves him for how he plays, the joy he plays with, and the fact that Steph Curry is a Christian, believes in Jesus Christ. And so before we went to the game, Hudson was trying to decide, should I wear my Timberwolves Ricky Rubio jersey or should I wear my Steph Curry Golden State Warriors jersey? Now, he liked Rubio. This was when Rubio was on the Timberwolves. He liked Rubio. You didn't get to live in my house if you didn't back then, but, but he really liked Steph Curry. But he was worried that when they showed him on the Jumbotron, the crowd at Target Center would boo him for wearing the opposing team's jersey. But he said to me, he said, you know what, I don't care. He said, I love Steph Curry, I'm gonna wear my Steph Curry jersey. I said, son, I am proud of you, but do you mind if I boo you? (laughs) Because I like the Timberwolves and, and and Ricky Rubio. So we get down to the game, 
And this Timberwolves employee ushers us out onto the court and we're standing waiting to go give the ball to this referee. And we're standing right next to the Warriors as they're warming up in their layup line. And it was crazy because this Timberwolves employee used to work at Steph Curry's agency. And so when he saw her, he came over and started talking to her right by us. And I'm like, quick, Hudson, get a picture. Here's your chance. But she said to Steph Curry, she said, Steph, I, I, you got to meet this little kid, Hudson. She said, he wore your jersey to the game tonight, even though he thinks he might get booed. And so Curry came over and introduced himself to my son. And I'll never forget his words. He said, oh, you made a conscious decision. I love that. He's seven. I don't know if anything was conscious back then. But, but he said, you made a conscious decision. Thanks for representing me so well. It was a pretty magical night right up until the Timberwolves lost in the last 10 seconds. And here was my reaction to that. <laughs> the guy who takes pictures for the wolves goes to our church and so when he saw the other team score a basket in the last 10 seconds he just locked right in on me wanted to see how his pastor was going to react in that moment and uh, sent me that picture so but here's the point Hudson was proud that he was a follower of Steph Curry that he liked Steph Curry and he was rewarded for it wasn't worried about a little booing wasn't worried about standing out in the crowd. He liked Steph Curry, and he was proud of it. Let me ask you, are you ashamed of your faith in Christ? Would you wear his jersey in public, so to speak? Or have you become worried of a little booing, of standing out in the crowd a little bit? I am living for that day when I get to shake the hand of a man far greater than Steph Curry. His name is Jesus Christ. And in that moment, I hope to hear him say, way to go. You made a conscious decision. Thanks for representing me so well. The Apostle Paul longed to hear those words he wrote in Romans. He said, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. He wasn't kidding. The book of Acts tells the story of Paul traveling around the Mediterranean world, trying to tell more people about Jesus. He got shipwrecked in Rome. I would have been out at that point. I would have said, you know what? I tried to tell people about Jesus, but I got shipwrecked. God closed the door. It was, it was just done. Paul kept going. He got marooned and stranded on the island of Malta. While he was there, he got bit by a poisonous snake, survived the snake bite only to face a mob in Ephesus. What was the mob angry about? Well, Paul was leading people to Jesus and away from their false gods, and that made the blacksmith who made statues of these false gods real angry because he was losing money. In Antioch and Iconium, it says the crowd turned into a murderous mob, stoned Paul, and dragged him out of the city, apparently dead. But as the believers stood around him, he got back up and went back into the city. Guy gets beat within an inch of his life, and he's like, you know what? There's more people who need to hear about Christ. I'm going back in. That challenges me. Because there are times when I get nervous to invite someone to church. And I work at this church. But I think to myself, well, what if they say no? And what if they're offended? And what if I, I don't want to be too pushy? And I just know that God wants me to invite them. I can just feel it, but I chicken out. And there are times when I'll be hanging out with a friend or a group of friends who don't believe in God, and I'll start to feel myself feeling pressure to act a different way and to use different language and to talk a different way. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work. If you don't tell someone about Christ, if you don't invite them, how can the power of God work saving people who believe? Let me ask you, have you been embarrassed about your faith lately? Is there a person, a neighbor, a family member, or friend that you just know that God wants you to invite them to church? God wants you to talk to them about Christ or to offer to pray for them? Is there somebody in your life, a friend or a group of friends that you find yourself acting differently around? 
work friends, high school friends, and you act and speak differently than you would around your church friends. We need to decide who we follow. Are we going to follow the people at work, the kid at school, or are we going to follow Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us? I never want to be embarrassed of a man who would hang on a cross for me. Second situation I want to ask you about is this. Are you willing to follow Christ even when it costs you? So let's go back to John chapter 6. Jesus says, are you offended? And this crowd of people looks at him. And here's what they said. They said, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. They're like, actually, yes. We were just here for some free food. We were just here for some good stuff. We didn't realize that you were the bread of life. And that we were going to have to believe in you. We didn't realize we were going to have to change our beliefs and change our behaviors and start to follow you. So yeah, we're out. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and he asked, are you going to leave too? And God may be asking you that question today. Are you going to leave too? Had a bad experience with the church? Had a bad experience with a Christian? Are you going to leave? Things didn't go the way you wanted them to go in life? and you're frustrated and disappointed with God, are you going to leave too? And I love how Peter responds. This is so powerful. Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You alone have the words that give eternal life. In other words, there's no alternative here. There's no other place to go. Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. When the Knights of Kemplar were baptized in ancient times, they were baptized holding their sword up out of the water. And symbolically, what they were saying was, God, you can have all of me, but you can't have that. If I need to use my sword to murder someone or to do something that you wouldn't want me to do, well, that's fine, because that's off limits. You can have me, God, but you can't have that. And I want to ask you today, is there a part of your life where you have said to God, God, you can have me, but you can't have that. God, I'll go wherever you want me to go, but I don't want to go there. God, I'll forgive whoever you want me to forgive, but I don't want to forgive them because they hurt me so bad. God, I'll love whoever you want me to love, but I don't want to love them. I don't want to love that group of people. God, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to move out. I'm not going to date someone different. I'm not going to stop doing that. Because you can have me, God, but, but, but you can't have that. If there's an area of your life like that today, if you would surrender it to him, if you would fully surrender it to God, there would be a blessing that gets poured out in your life. There would be a blessing of God's presence and God's protection. The Bible says his love is better than life and you'd begin to experience that. You really would. You'd experience God's very best in his plan for your life. So today I want to lead us in a moment of prayer to just say, God, I surrender fully to you. I want to follow you, God, no matter if it costs me. Even if I have to sacrifice, even if it costs me in some way or I lose something, God, I'm willing to follow you. Let's pray together. You can remain seated. God, I pray for anyone here or viewing this message online who may be ready to leave. Had a bad experience, things aren't going well, and they're just ready to walk away from you or walk away from church. God, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And God, if there's an area of our life that we need to surrender to you, God, we do that right now. Give us the courage and the strength and the conviction to give all of ourselves to you, God, even if it costs us. Because we want your very best, God. 
right now, God, we declare that we follow you. And we're gonna struggle with sin, but God, we're fully committed. We're all in, we're fully devoted. And I pray that you would lead us and guide us. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, come on down front. Otherwise, have a great day, everybody.